Hello and welcome to the Business of Authority. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Rochelle Moulton. And today, it's kind of like a book report day today. We're going to do, yeah. we're going to talk specifically around uh, building a business around your genius because Rochelle, you went on a deep dive in a whole bunch of books over vacation. I did, you know, give us a week off and I go insane. <laughs> yeah, you read like six <laughs> books, it sounded like. I did. And I, some of them I was reading at the same time, like I would switch back and forth. And these are big idea books. So they're, you know, they're kind of fun to either fully absorb yourself in them or hop around a little bit and see how different authors address different things. Mm -hmm. But the book that really hit me is, is called The Big Leap. And it's by Gay Hendricks. And what I hadn't realized, and I'm actually a little bit embarrassed by, is he's the guy, apparently, that coined the term the genius zone. And I use that all the time mm -hmm. without realizing where it came from. It's not that I thought I invented it, but it just I just think of it as part of my shtick. And so, um, <laughs> and he wrote the this book, I think, in the early 2010s. And um, the the premise, well, let me let me explain the premise of the book because let's talk about that first. So the premise of the book, The Big Leap, is that we sabotage ourselves from having everything that we want. So his idea of the perfect life, and I frankly have to agree, is it's an upward spiral of constantly spending as much time as possible in your genius zone. Hmm. And again, he calls it zone of genius, but same concept. And so I, I just, I love that idea. And he uses all sorts of examples about how we can sabotage. But I think the thing that was most interesting, at least to me, is how he looks at essentially your your zones that there are four zones of competence one of them is genius mm. so if you imagine if you like draw a vertical line down the middle of the piece of paper and then you draw a horizontal line okay yeah. so you've got four quadrants yeah so the lower left hand quadrant is your zone of incompetence <laughs> incompetence so the things you are just not good at you know you're not good at you suck at them <laughs> Okay, so most people are pretty clear on what those are. I mean, I, I bet anybody listening to this could jot down like three, four, five, ten oh, yeah. things right. really quickly, right? And then it gets more complicated. So if you move to the right, so you're the lower right hand quadrant, that's your zone of competence. So this is where you're good at something, like you're not great at it, you're not the best at it, but you're good at it, mm -hmm. you know. And so, so I. You know, if, if I were making a list of things, I could say, well, um, you know, the sort of the bookkeeping for my business, like I would be competent at that. Not how to set up the structure, but just to make sure the stuff goes in the right boxes, I would be competent. Mm. Not great, <laughs> but not incompetent, like I could figure it out. So the zone of competence, and that's kind of what I think we spend a lot of our, the early part, the very early part of our career, trying to find that. Right. Like, what's the part that we're... We're, we're competent at because we're looking to become good and better. Then when you move up, if you go to the left side on the upper left quadrant, that's your zone of excellence. And this is the trap, right? Because we all have things that we are really excellent at, but guess what? Somebody else is excellent at them too. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we could do it all day long. But there's lots of other people that can do it, too. So it's almost like saying that we're not special enough in that quadrant. Yep. And I kind of think of this a lot of times when you look at branding questions with soloists, is that they're doing something that they're really excellent at, but they kind of look like everybody else. Right. They're not distinctive enough yet. Before we move on from there, do you think it's a framing thing or do you think it is a um it's a i don't want to say lack of focus but it's like a, a decision that to specialize that hasn't been made yet or is it really just that they're presenting themselves in a way that comes across as as apples to apples with a bunch of competition let's say i i've seen it both ways mm -hmm. i think a lot of times it's that um we don't recognize how special a particular talent we have is because it comes so naturally okay yeah. like oh yeah everybody can do that no, they can't. <laughs> right. This is really, really special about you. And that's the thing. And it's, it's, there's a, a humility about it that's actually endearing, uh, but not when you're running your own business. That's when you really want to own 
what you do that is really special that also that you want to do. I want to make that clear too, because there, you know, I've, I've talked before about there's certain uh, things that we do that over the course of our career, we kick to the curb yeah. for, you know, really logical reasons. You just say, you know what? I've done that. I don't want to do it anymore. I could be excellent at that, but I don't choose to do it anymore. Right. So there, there's that. So when you think about filling out like your zone of excellence, you really want to ask yourself, like, what are those things that you're really, really good at? Then the tricky part for a lot of people is, you know, the moment where you go, oh, this is my genius zone. This is where I'm, I'm feeling it. So the idea of the genius zone is that it's something that you do that you're so good at and you do it unlike anyone else. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is really hard. I know it's been hard for me over the years to figure it out, but it's that's hard because first of all, you know, you're what is it you say? You're inside the bottle, yeah, right. So it's hard to understand sometimes what you do that's so special. But over time, the more people that you meet, the more examples you have in life of what other people are doing, you start to hone in on what you do differently from anybody else. Nice and. What I loved about this book, and what's interesting is he wrote a second book called The Genius Zone, but he doesn't just he doesn't describe these these quadrants because he did it in in The Big Leap. But the idea in this in this book was the one of the ways that we sabotage ourselves is we stay in our zone of competence or excellence. Yeah, we actively push away opportunities to really be in our genius zone it's almost like who am i to have it this good <laughs> yeah i mean right? I, I laugh but i just had a conversation with someone who's exactly you're describing exactly the situation where it's like why do i like i, I want x and it's right there and i keep not doing it <laughs> you know yeah. and it's like yeah well, one of the examples um, Hendricks used in the book is he said, you know, you, you, ha you own a business and you're doing amazing work and you just got like a big client and you're on top of the world and you go home and you pick a fight with your spouse. Yeah, okay. And it's not that like they started it, like you literally go home and you pick the fight and it's, there's that part of, of us, because I really do think this is, exists in everybody. There's that part of us that goes, yeah, yeah, this is just too good. I, I can't, I can't do this. And the way he describes, and he, he does this more in the second book, The Genius Zone, but the way he describes this upward spiral, and the idea is we keep getting better. It's not like, you know, we just like snap our fingers and boom, we're 100% in our genius zone, but it's a spiral upward. It keeps getting better as we allow ourselves to focus on our genius zone, as we take the risks to do that, which he doesn't talk about as much. But as we take the risk to be in our genius zone and we allow ourselves to be happy. Hmm. What, what's the leap in the title? Oh, the big leap is to get to getting to your genius zone all the time. Okay. That's the leap. And so I, I, I forget which book it is of his now, but he has an, an exercise. It's really simple. It's like you ask yourself, like, what percentage of my time am I spending in my genius zone? Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, it might be 15 minutes a day an hour a day. Um, and, you know, the example I think of is like when I, when I had a business with multiple employees, I, I probably spent a very small portion of my day in my genius yeah. zone. I was constantly trying to get a bigger percentage of it, but there were certain things I felt like I quote unquote had to do. And right. if I was doing that now, I would do it differently, right? I would outsource or I would um, find somebody else in my team to do it, or I would decide it didn't need to be done. But if you think about, I don't know if he says it this way exactly, but it's how I, it was my takeaway. If you think about your life as a constant journey to get to an upward spiral, spiral of living in your genius zone, mm -hmm. like how freaking great is that? Right. Right. Yeah. And it's not it's, just about yeah. work. It's also about your relationships and your life. Like maybe work is, you know, is just, you know, a third of your life and or or a fifth of your life. And there's other things, your relationships, um, something you do in the community. I mean, it's this idea that you can constantly be spiraling upward. Mm. I don't know. Does he talk about it in the book? Because I've about this where I find that um, 
Well, I guess the question is like, in the author's experience, does your genius zone meaningfully change over time or are you kind of always spiraling into the same point on the horizon? Well, I, I, I think it's, I think it's the former. I think that it's, it changes over time. Although when he uses himself as an example, like the story he tells, let me see if I can get this right. So the story he tells is that he was off on, I think it was a multi-country speaking tour. And he had this, this company that he and uh, I think his wife had built. Yes. That, Cause they do some work together. So they, they had this company that they'd built and he came back from two or three months on the road, like exhausted, but feeling like the happy warrior. Mm-hmm. Like I've come back, I, you know, I'm ready to go <laughs> back into hero. life. And he goes to his office and his COO comes out and says, oh, I, we have to talk to you because we made a mistake on the tax accruals. <laughs> and so all of a sudden he needed to come up with like $100,000 to pay taxes. And he's, he, he's walking in, he's going, oh, crap. Like I just did all of this and for what? I came home and I had to do this and it's not I, it's not what I want to do. So after some, you know, deep thinking, he started to realize that his genius zone was in the writing. He's written multiple books and he speaks, he, he and his wife gives give workshops and he said, that's it. And he figured out what he thought his genius zone was at that point and he let go of the company. Right, I don't okay. recall if he said he sold it or if it just gradually if they the other people bought it. But he, you know, he in that moment was like something has to change. And I think that happens for a lot of people. I know it's happened to me. Imagine it's happened to you where you just you sort of have a breaking point and you go, "No. I don't want to do this anymore. Something has to change and I'm going to change it." Right. Yeah. And, or, I, or I'm going to figure out what it is and then change it. Right. Yeah. Okay, so that that did answer the sort of poorly worded question in my mind. The the wondering in my mind was um, how much change, how much would you refine it or, you know, perhaps um, discover that you were wrong about it, but it's, it's way bigger than like a business model or something like that. It's like, yeah, it's almost like a, a trait. It feels like there must be a difference between the, this definition of the genius zone and like your the way that you like to spend time because it's a different kind of spending time so like like let's say you just like really love playing csgo or like some video game mm-hmm. you know that doesn't feel genius zoning to me if it's not it, there feels like there there needs to be some kind of productive element to it or creative element to it that is in service of others or something but maybe i'm just like layering my own bias on top of it yeah it could be a little bit of both here because you know he talks about his relationships with his family with his friends um in in his view i don't disagree his work is about helping other people and so for him i think if and i'm again i'm guessing i don't i don't know mr hendrix <laughs> um but i'm guessing that he views his life as an integrated one, i.e. work and personal life just kind of flow. It's all the same, yeah. But yeah, but I, I had the same reaction because sometimes like with hobbies, like do you have to be the best in the world to be able to do your hobby? No, of course not. But it, I, I, think, I think what this premise would say is that it engages you in a way it's sort of like the flow concept where you lose track of time. And so that's awesome. But not if it's work. Like if it's work, then you want to obviously get in that genius zone where what you're contributing is unlike anybody else. And it uses every aspect of you. Well, not every aspect, but the critical aspects of you. Mm. And it's, it's nobody else could do it exactly the same way that you do. Right. And I've always approached that when I've done branding, I've always approached it from, you know, let's market that part of you. Like, let's find that and let's fine tune it and hone it. But his perspective is really that this is what makes you a full human being in service to the planet, is that you do nobody any favors by staying in your zone of excellence or your zone of competence. Yeah, that's what I was going for. Right. Because like, uh, you know, I certainly have been gone through phases where I was just like doing activities that are like super duper in the zone. So the, in a flow state, rehearsing with a band or um, even recording like uh, an album or 
coding, building, especially something I was building for myself, where you just like, you're like, oh my God, I just stayed up for two days. Like you don't even, <laughs> right? And you just sort of look up and it's, it's uh, the birds are chirping, like what? And, but, but in many of those cases, it wasn't in service of anyone or anything else. It was just me um, enjoying the thing, right? It's like, it yeah. wasn't for anyone. Uh, so to me, and perhaps I'm trying to like, but you loved I, it. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that's the point. But and it doesn't so, feel like it doesn't, but it's definitely not genius zone. It's just flow state. Yeah. And he doesn't, he doesn't distinguish those. I mean, he's about the genius zone and the genius zone is one thing. He doesn't talk about flow and talk about any of that. Um, but as I was reading it, I mean, I kind of had the same reaction at first. It's like, well, what about hobbies? And like the easy example would be, you know, we talked last week about your doing your bathroom yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously that's not in your genius zone, no. but that's not why you're doing it. Right. You're not doing it to make money. You're doing it for a variety of reasons. And one of them has to do with that. You're enjoying the process, not every moment of the process, <laughs> but right. But you have a vision in mind for what it's going to be and the experience it's going to be. Right. That's different. Right. But if you had said, Rochelle, I'm going to become a contractor and I'm going to just do bathrooms. I would, I would have an intervention with you. <laughs> I just would. But that's, I, that's how I see the difference is the things that you do like for love, right? Yeah. The things that you do for love and, and they add to the quality of your life. Um, I think if, if I were to put words in his mouth is I would say that the genius zone is about how you contribute to the world by bringing it your best talent. Yeah, I, I agree that that has to be a component. And one of the things that one of otherwise you're just, you know, playing scales to a metronome for nobody. And if, if you at and the reason why I keep I'm having a really hard time thinking of this outside of a business context is because if you are generating income, if you're, if you're selling stuff, that's a side effect of creating value for people. So it's, it indicates that you're doing something right in service of other people if they're paying you money. So to, to, in my mind, I'm kind of simplifying the genius zone by, oh, I oversimplifying it sounds like, by saying like, you know, you're in this, you're in a flow state and making money. Because if you're making money, it means you're making somebody's life better. Mm -hmm. But the money is, again, it's a side effect. It's not, it's not the point. It's more like, fuel or oxygen and you know without it you're not going to be able to keep you stay in your gen genius zone all the time because you have to do something to make money so if you can well, part of his premise though is that you make money and you make a lot the more you focus on your genius zone provide you know obviously there has to be a market for it but the more you focus on it the more likely you will create abundance money relationships um results goodwill whatever those things are. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky when you think about how you thread all this through. Like I'm thinking, you know, I just recently sold the property that I developed with a partner and my little side hustle. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about it when I was reading the book because I had just closed on it. And I realized that there was a piece of the work that was absolutely in my genius zone, that finding the right property, figuring out how to, uh, how to get it ready, like how, how much to do, like what price to get it at, how much to do to get it ready to rent. And then when it was time to, to sell it, what to do to make it, to maximize the bottom line. That was really good. But all the other stuff was not in my genius zone. And, you know, I did right. it. I think I was, I was uh, at least competent and often excellent. Mm -hmm. But that, that, the only part that was really my genius zone was this one piece. Right. I like that wasn't, that's not enough. Right. So, yeah, I mean, and it's, again, that's business, but there was a part of the reason that I did it had a bigger vision, which wasn't going to get achieved because it wasn't enough in my genius zone for me to want to keep doing it. Right. You're a flipper. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, but not really, because what I love, I love the thinking about it, but I really don't want to manage all the details like a yeah. flipper. Yeah, yeah, you have the vision, but that's like 5% of it. I mean, it's 50 to 90% of the value of it, but it's 5% of the work. 
Mm. Most of the work is, okay, get the, get the guy to come in and do the bathroom. Where's the plumber? Where's the electrician? Who's going to show up? It's like all that stuff. And I really don't care to do that. Right. So it's like, I yeah. have to do like 90 minutes of something I don't want to do to get 10 minutes of something that I do. That's not, that's not sustainable. Yeah. If you want to have this upward spiral of your genius zone. And that's, I'm sure you see the same thing. You have people come to you and they say, oh, you know, I'm just like, I'm just not happy day to day. I love this client work that I'm doing, but oh, it's it, this particular thing. The most I get is an hour a day. The rest of it is all this stuff that I hate. Right. Yeah. I mean, most people I talk to are, are pretty solidly in the, somewhere in the competence excellence area. And they don't even think about, uh, they don't even think about like, they think about improving things, but it's kind of like a mystery to them what that would be. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah, and it's and honestly, it's it, and they can't. There's often so, and this was me, twenty, ten, fifteen, twenty years ago, I guess, when I was like uh, to the mid early two thousands, when I was you know came out of a Fortune fifty corporate job and then went to work at a, an agency or a dev shop, and it was just all client work, all reactive, uh, and you, I couldn't, almost all client work. And when you're doing client work all the time and you're in this reactive mode, it's, I don't know, it's just, it's almost like a mystery how to, like, how how could this be different? Like, there's no, it doesn't seem, <laughs> like, especially if you're billing by the hour, selling selling time, you're like, ah, what is what is the next step? I know I want to get to a next step, but I don't even know what it is. Never mind how to get there. Well, that's the big question, isn't it? R- right, right. And so that's so that's where they are, and the and the sort of commodity is overstating it, but they look like the same as a lot of other people. They don't look like unique in many ways or any ways. They might be really good at what they do, but but the client can't tell the difference between this expert and that expert, and or or this person who does excellent work or somebody who, you know, maybe they'll find out too late didn't do excellent work. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it feels like the the process of honing down, for me, the process of honing down on, I guess, you know, to the extent that I would call it my genius zone is really just like looking at the stuff that drains me and not doing it anymore, whether that means delegating it or automating it or getting rid of it so that I've just got more time to do stuff that energizes me or makes me feel stronger. And I just kind of follow that compass. So that's yeah. why I don't have employees because it takes a lot of time to do a good job leading people. And that's not my genius zone. So that's like one of the, it's the same, it's the same concept. I don't, I don't think of it as genius zone, but it's just like, I don't want to do that. And there are ways that I can get around needing it. So I'll do that instead. Well, and here's the trap, right? It's the, Trap is excellent. Like I'm thinking of uh, a community thing I did recently where I had to, I had to lead people, including a, a couple of employees. And I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like to do that anymore. But I'm good at it. I mean, I mm-hmm. care about them. They are good people. They work hard. They know stuff. I, I, you know, they've forgotten more about their area of expertise than I will ever know. Mm-hmm. And so mad respect, all of that, but it wasn't using my genius zone. And in fact, it was depleting me. Right. Every single day, it was a drag and uh, like a drag on my energy. I mean, yeah. And so, yeah. And that's the trap. And I think sometimes we think, especially if we've been an employee for a certain amount of time, we're like, well, I guess that just goes with the territory. Right. It's cost of doing business. That's the yeah. only way to scale. That's what you have yeah. to do. That's what I, everyone tells me to do. I know. And, and this is not a show where we, we're trying to say having employees is bad. There are people where it's really in their genius zone and they're amazing. Totally. And I've worked with people like that. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. But if it's not, or if you don't want it to be, I mean, when I started my first company, I wanted to lead people. I wanted to sell work and I wanted to run a business. I wanted to do all three of those things um, because I, I was enjoying them the pieces that i did i was enjoying them inside a big firm but i couldn't do them the way i wanted to it was like my elbows were strapped against my body like i couldn't (laughs) i couldn't do it and then so so that was the driver and then i learned oh yeah no i don't really want to do all three of those i mean i'm glad i did i learned a lot but no i'm gonna hone my genius zone a little bit more right 
and, you know, and realize, you know, what's in it and what's not in it. And it absolutely is a trajectory. It's a process. And I just love Hendrick's image of this upward spiral. I wish you could see me. My hand is like, I'm actually yeah. looks a little bit like a royal wave going up. <laughs> but if you think about it, that every day that you're alive, you could get a little bit more into your genius zone. Right. And assuming you know, assuming you you have a, a whiff of where it is and you can follow your nose toward it, this, the, the, I think the mysterious thing that people can't get their head around, or that's not the right way to put it, but the, the thing that keeps them blind to it is that it means doing less of a bunch of stuff that you do, and it's probably stuff that you're pretty good at. Mm -hmm. So that feels weird. It's like, wait, do less? Do fewer things to, to get ahead? That's, it's counterintuitive. So in that, that thing where like, oh, I have to do all of these things, I have to do all these things, I have to do all these things, everybody tells me, that I got to hustle, I got to grind, or I got to, you know, I got to be on social media, or all of these things that everyone tells you you have to do to be successful um, are like, you know, maybe they work for someone, maybe they work for a lot of people. But if, if it, again, if it drains you, find, find a different way, like use that. I, I, I feel like I am much more sensitive to this than I was in the past. I think I'm, I think I am I don't know, I guess I have nothing to compare it to other than my younger self and some people I coach, but I'm really sensitive. So it's like a it's like a giant red flag if I don't feel like doing something. And it's like, all right, why don't I feel like doing this? Is it like a dip type thing like we've talked about before? Is it is it like the only path out is through this distasteful task? Or because sometimes that's true and it's just gonna be over and and it's done. But anything systemic in my business, anything that's like a recurring meeting or anything that, that has sort of infinite unbounded scope, you know, like it's never done. Mm -hmm. If it, one of those things I don't, I don't want to do, I just, I guess I'm just honest with myself at the end of the day, I'm not going to do it or I'm going to half-ass it, which might even be worse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like, what, do, you know, like, like, uh, you know, pff, bookkeeping, forget it. I would screw that up so bad. Like, yes, I outsource <laughs> that. You know, I just that's in your incompetence zone. Oh yeah, hundred yeah. percent in my incompetence zone. Can't make myself do it. Just, just blind. To, I just look at the thing. I'm like, nope, not gonna read it. <laughs> so, the, I think that anyway. The point is that that at least for me, moving from excellence to genius, if if that if that's the right terminology for me, I'm not really sure. But but moving forward, or I also like that sort of upward spiral into. Uh, an ideal is all about being no it's like self knowledge like what mm -hmm. it's just knowing what's a drag what is a drag on your energy and what is fuel and chasing the one that's fuel and that means doing yeah. a lot it, it can mean doing a lot less stuff or certainly a new set of tasks like hopefully you're going to be doing more of the things that energize you and and fewer of the things that don't but it could just be that you do fewer of the things that don't and the other takes care of itself, which is counterintuitive. Well, and I think there's this other thing. I, I, I guess maybe I'll call it guilt. And there's a lot of people who feel guilty because, oh yeah, I have to do this thing for my family. I have to. Have like to. I have to go get the groceries. I have to mow the lawn, whatever those things are. And so there's this block to hiring or outsourcing the things that must get done, right? There are things that must get done. And so somebody will say, oh, you know, I can't, I can't pay $100 to have somebody come and mow my lawn. Well, yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. So if you freed yourself of that hour, what would you do with that hour? You'd probably get better ideas for your business if you're in our kind of an expertise business. Or you could use that time to play with your kids or go practice your hobby. I mean, mm. it, and it's, so there's this, there's guilt. And then sometimes it's fear, like, well, I'm not making enough in my business to take this and offload it. Yes, but if you did, you would make more because you wouldn't be spending 25% of your time on this stuff. I mean, right. people who are, you know, who are not coders, who are doing their own websites, get out of here, go hire somebody <laughs> to do it. It's never going to be as good as what somebody else where it's in their genius zone as what somebody else would do. It's going to take you forever. No, I mean, unless you, you know, you want to teach yourself coding because that's a new hobby you want, but 
Even then, I would still hire somebody for a business so that you, it doesn't look like amateur hour. Right. Yeah, there's a, the, the mowing the lawn thing is it raises a, an angle that I have definitely encountered with other people where they feel like they should, our favorite word, mm-hmm. they should be doing this. You know, like I'm a bad person because what my parents told me if I don't mow my own lawn or, you know, that's a stupid right. example. But I know people who are mothers that have certain that feel the pressure of societal expectations that they do certain mm-hmm. things that are not that they would never outsource. And that's maybe an extreme example, maybe an emotional example. But there are lots of things inside your inside of a business where there's this sort of, I, I think, common sense that's maybe not so sensible about how things have to be inside of a business. And uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> I have to and be like, a grown up. That's I always think of it that way. I have to be a grown mm, up. Yeah. And, like, and yeah. then it's, and then it's, it's a cost of doing business that there's a bunch of crap that you have to do. Mm-hmm. And it's just not true, right? Like, like having a business is like, it can be so much fun. Like I, I'm getting to a point where, like, you know, obviously I have, uh, you know, friends and family we've talked about before, and and almost none of them are in business for themselves. And I and I think more of them would be if they didn't see it as like this, like putting on a suit. Like I mean, metaphorically speaking, like mm-hmm. if they realized how much fun it was and how much more secure it is than a job, I feel like more certainly many of them are capable. Of it, but I think the perception is that you're gonna you're a workaholic, or you have to be a workaholic, or you know you can never punch out, so to speak, mentally and like relax and like that's just not true. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's not the way it has to be. But I think a lot of people kind of they kind of play grown up, or they imagine that they're gonna have to pretend to be a grown up to do to do it, and it, you it's really doesn't need to be like that. It can be exactly the way you want it. I have a theory about that, which is okay. that most of us, the business who, who, you know, didn't grow up with people who were creating businesses, most of us look at retail businesses as an example because we're surrounded by you can them. See them. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not talking about like a grocery store unless it's a little family, you know, store, but, and you see, they go in and out of business. You see, um, oh, if you right. get to really know them, you see that they're freaking tired right? Yeah, because, you're right. And they're not making a lot of money and they have, you know, security concerns. They have rent that keeps going up. Inventory. They have supplier Shrink. problems. Yeah. yeah. And so, so I think we sort of internalize, oh yeah, that's really hard. That's a really I don't good point. Do that. Yeah. yeah. I think you're right. It's like the worst kind of business <laughs> to be like. It's, it is. It's, it's the, if you look at a list, I just saw one recently. I wish I could remember uh, who put it together, but it's, I just saw a list recently and and retail is down at the bottom. Like there's the the most businesses in the U.S. are retail, a like classic brick and mortar, and they have the lowest profit margin. Oh, it's brutal. It was I something don't like four percent. Yeah, I, I yeah, it's so it's right. God, this is this is a really good observation because I have them now and then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, think about it. Yeah, restaurants, same thing. It's, yeah. it's a terrible business. I mean, if you want to do it, great. You family business. I mean, we've got actually, I think the only kind of entrepreneurial relatives I have run a family diner and it's got, mm. it's got pros and cons. You could have a TV show about this place. It's hilarious, but uh, I'll bet you're right because it's a brutal, like when, <laughs> when you look at the profit margins for like a retail business, it's like anything that has to carry inventory and it's like, uh, I'm like, I, why why yeah. you need to love this because why bother yeah you're making a bet that what you love somebody else is going to love and <sighs> and a lot of retail businesses are hobby businesses exactly somebody goes oh i think everybody would be would so love fun to run a to convenience have, store yeah. well a gift store apparently is the one that most people like to run because they're like oh i love to buy and give gifts well guess what the chances of in whatever town you're in your taste being exactly the same as everybody else and creating an experience that offsets the fact that they could go to Amazon and buy it after they see it in your store. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a challenge. Yeah, I have a friend. I have a friend who ran a surf shop in his town, and had a horrible, horrible experience that I think is very common. 
uh and now he's doing great running a SaaS. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. and like the difference between those two kinds of businesses obviously there's risks to everything but like zero marginal cost hello this is like a this is like fantasy land that we live in that you can have essentially zero marginal cost on uh digital products and services it's amazing so anyway the point it being is. that there's just like there's like a or just selling transformation or whatever you know the the oh man i'm not i'm, I'm gonna get hung up on this we have to i'll have to you'll have to f kick me off of this hook but the <laughs> the fact that most people who have jobs are exposed to the worst kind of business and that's all they know about it is that's very interesting yeah. when i say worst i mean least profitable yeah least profitable i don't remember if i told this story on the show but when i lived in D.C., Washington, D.C., I thought I might do a retail business. And I came up with a concept that I was really excited about, but I'd never done a retail business. It, like, I don't know how this is going to work. And I'd never heard of the kind of business. Well, I'll explain it. I, I wanted to do an olive oil and like a spice, really spice business primarily and then have olive oils. And of course, now those exist. But back then they didn't. And I was I was looking at storefronts in Alexandria, Virginia, which gets a lot of traffic. So I started, I did a lot of research because I'd never done it before. And I looked at the numbers. And I went, no way. Like this can't everything, be right. everything would have to come out so incredibly perfect. And I had nothing to look at that would give me any indication that it would work. Uh, right. I was like, uh, this is not for me. I never considered a retail business ever, ever again. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So, so we have the opposite. We are blessed with having some kind of expertise mm -hmm. that we can sell to other people. And um, there was something I, I saw the other day that said, um, you know, if you're struggling in your business and, and struggling to make it, I'm not talking about like to increase your profit margin or to get a new client, but if you're really struggling to make it, then ask yourself, look around. Are there other people doing what you're doing that are making money? Yes or no? The answer is yes, it's you. And by that, I mean, you have an opportunity. If somebody else is making it in that, in that niche, in that business, you can too. You just have to find the magic formula for you, which is not going to be the same as that other person. If nobody's making money, then the problem isn't you. The problem is, you know, the niche or the business, like retail. Mm -hmm. as example. Yeah, there's no, right. Like, like if it's the first, the sort of first thing you said, other people are making money, then it's probably under your control to fix that. Mm -hmm. You know, like you said, find find the way that it's going to work. You know, just keep messing with the business model, keep switching things around, experiment, experiment, experiment. Yes. But if there's just no demand, there's really nothing, uh, nothing you can yeah. do. Cut your losses and move cut on. Cut your to losses the next and move thing. on. Yeah. Yeah. And again, even in expertise, like cut your losses in retail, it means get out of the, the lease and close it down. In our kind of business, cut your losses could be switch your niche, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm going to take the same skill set, but I'm going to apply it to a different market. Right. Or I'm going to, instead of having things that have um, you know six-figure price tags, I'm going to grow my audience and have things that have three-figure or four-figure price tags. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, different yeah. packaging. Exactly. Yeah, different packaging, different niche, different, you can, you can, Turn all these levers, turn all these levers, turn all these knobs, you know, turn yeah. levers um, to, to, you know, experiment with different things, package the expertise in different ways, bring it to different markets, find some demand or find a way to, you know, uh, reframe the outcomes so that it, it is recognized as a solution to the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the key, I want to come back to, you know, our, our title here. I think the key is about finding your genius zone. And if you're struggling with that, you know, one of the things you can do is you can look at your testimonials from clients and see what they say, because there's mm. probably an answer in there somewhere. Um, not in every one necessarily, but there may be a theme that's running through it. The other thing you can do is you can ask, and when I say friends, I mean like friends who really know you and are welcoming, not the one that you go to when you need a critique. Do mm -hmm. not go to them for this one. And basically ask them, like, what do you what do you get from me that you don't get from anybody else? Like, what's that experience or what's the thing? What's the feeling? And between those two, between hearing that from clients or from prospects, 
and from friends, people who know you on a deeper level, it's sometimes that can just spark something that you didn't see before. And again, this is about ease. It's about those things that come naturally to you that maybe you're undervaluing because they come so easily. Right. Yeah. You couldn't imagine air quotes charging for them because it's like, uh, it doesn't seem fair. Air quotes fair. Well, and the other thing is when you're an employee, you have, have an annual review at least, and somebody pounds you on the head for all of your weaknesses. <laughs> oh, I got to get better at my weaknesses. And so sometimes we take that into our business and we're like, oh yeah, I got to do better at my weaknesses. No. Yeah, opposite. Somebody else do, the, do that or don't do it at all. You focus on what you're great at yeah. and do even more. Right. Yeah. Like work on the strengths. Ignore, the, not ignore the weaknesses, but just let those go one yeah. way or the other. Yeah. Yeah. It's like trying to teach a fish to fly. Like don't, no. you know, be a fish. Yeah. Use your energy to just swim. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So what's the, is, is the book just sort of a you know introducing this big idea or does it does it get into sort of tactical approaches like you know you started to describe just then like if if someone just didn't have any idea then how would they get started and you said testimonials and like asking for a constructive friend what they think what do you do that's with that not in, that's not in the book no um now he's he's got two books that i've read the first one is The Big Leap, and that's the one I've really been talking about with this idea of how you think about a genius zone. The second book that I've read, he's written many, um, is The Genius Zone. And the second one is, more, is, a, is slightly more practical, although it doesn't go into these four zones. But it's, it's really like a mindset book about how to get yourself in this mindset of continually spiraling upward. Mm -hmm. So it's heavily mindset, but it's practical in, in that sense. But it is about mindset. The first book is, is also mindset because he's a psychologist, a therapist, psychologist. Um, but the first one is really more about, okay, I'm going to show you that you are sabotage, probably sabotaging, sabotaging yourself. Because if you're not living fully in your genius zone, you have opportunities to increase the percentage that you're not taking advantage of. Mm -hmm. And you're your own worst enemy. If I were to say it in like a paragraph, that's, that's sort of how I would describe that book. So it just depends on which is more interesting to you. But I, I would actually argue, I would read both of them and I'd read The Big Leap first and I'd read The Genius Zone second. Hmm. A ringing endorsement. Yeah, I, I think it was great. <laughs> cool. Well, I mean, it does, uh, obviously, I mean, there's it's no... No surprise that it's a term that made it into the center of your lexicon because, you know, this is kind of, kind of like the overall subject of this podcast in general. It's like, a, or it's certainly a, a major pillar of the kinds of things we talk about. So, you know, maybe I, my guess would be that most people listening are probably, uh, probably skewing in the right direction. They're probably already better than competent, maybe feeling excellent maybe feeling a sense of mastery about whatever it is that they do and then there's maybe the, the the next level is letting go of anything that's not genius zone and moving into like looking for things to just shed so that I, so that you can sort of float up in this spiral like i love the up direction of it yeah like i use the term spiraling in a lot because that's how it kind of feels but i like the up angle because it feels like it feels like letting things go so you can you can like ballast, letting ballast go so you can rise. Well, it's also operating at your highest, um, what's the word I want to use? It's not efficiency, but your highest potential. Yeah. Because we're all born with the potential for greatness. I believe that to the bottom of my toes. I believe that. <laughs> and, and a lot of people have a lot of challenges thrown at them early. A lot of people in the States, we're already, we, we were born on third base and don't realize it. Um, mm. And so it's part of this is, is finding those things and trusting that the more you move into that genius zone, not only the better you'll feel, the, the more money you'll make, but the more impact you're going to have on the world. Right. Great. That might be a good place to leave it. What do you think? Yeah. All right, folks. That's it for this week. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Rochelle Moulton. And we hope you join us again next time on The Business of Authority. Bye. Bye-bye.